John here. Let's start with the objectives. I guess it goes without saying, or more accurately, <laughs> it goes without writing, that I'm going to aim for a Z80-based uh, retro-style uh, computer here in this project. All right. Now to achieve that goal and to make it cost effective and generally fun for anybody that wants to try and make one of these things, I want to keep the PC board size down to a hundred millimeter by hundred millimeter square or smaller. Why? Because this is the maximum size. If you order from one of the uh, common uh, uh, board manufacturing houses that uh, they give you a special prototyping discount price if you do not exceed this size. So this is where we want to be, right? That or smaller. Uh, I want to support the standard CPM peripherals, a console, a printer, and some preferably floppy disks. But in all honesty, floppy disks, as I mentioned down here, I'm going to use a micro SD instead of a floppy disk because uh, floppy disks are today a little expensive, especially if you want eight inch ones, right? They're at least $200 a piece for old beat up ones on eBay. I noticed this morning while Googling around, uh, that's not really all that fun. And the other problem with uh, floppy disks is most people don't have any floppy drives anymore on their PC or their laptop or anything. So creating the initial disk getting it formatted and getting the operating system image onto the floppy is probably cost prohibitive or impossible for some people. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and go with micro SD card in lieu of the floppy disks. All right. For the printer, I want to make it compatible with the Centronics uh, standard so that I can plug in my Epson RX80, which I got some you know, 38, 40 years ago. This thing was incredibly common, very popular printer. And, uh, you know, I, it, I should be able to run it with this thing, all right? Uh, you, the Centronics, by the way, is also the electrical interface on the, like an IBM PC parallel port, okay? That's also based on Centronics. And uh, we will support the pinout that the IBM PC has so that we can use standard IBM PC parallel printer cables and printers. Anything that works on an IBM PC should work on this board as well. That's my point here, right? So if we go Centronics and we go with the compatible connector that the PC used, which is not, by the way, the Centronics connector, then we would be compatible with just about any printer out there that has a parallel port on it, okay? Uh, I want to only use through hole parts. This should make it attainable. Anybody that can operate a soldering iron and solder a resistor or a dip chip into a PC board should be able to build this project. Now, this goal is attained, as we'll see, but in order to solder in a micro SD socket, the only ones I could find are surface mount sockets. So in order to get a through hole implementation, what I did is I give you two options. There's a header on the board that we'll see in the final design where you can just go over to SparkFun and just buy a $5 adapter board and be done with it. Or I also have on the board a space where you can solder in the micro SD uh, socket if you want and keep all the parts all on one board. Okay, so you got two options here. But the only part that this affects is the um, micro SD connector. All right, so yeah, you can build this using only through whole parts. I also want to do away with all these crazy things. Uh, you know, I, look, this isn't a money maker. Okay, <laughs> no matter who does this, no one's going to make money off this. Uh, in other words, I'm not going to try and sell you pals, gals, and e-proms and all that. No, I don't want to deal with this. A lot of projects out there I've noticed, and the main motivation to even do this project is because I look at some other ones that are out there, and they have multi-board designs, and they have PALs on them. And they, some of them put like a, a ESP32 in there and all that. And that's actually, those are really great projects. I'm not dissing those projects by any means. However, if you want to build one of these entirely on your own, just go out and buy parts from DigiKey and bring this thing up from scratch. You you know, you would need to buy a programmer in order to make these parts. And those are not exactly cheap. And uh, nobody uses UV erasable EEPROMs anymore because you can get the exact same chip and the exact same pinout in a flash uh, prom instead. So I'm going to use the flash uh, proms for this project. 
It's not to say you cannot use a UVE prom. The board should be compatible with that. Although I do admit, I looked at the design this morning. <laughs> I do need to change one single pin on the EEPROM in order to make it compatible with a UV style. Let me know in the comments below if you're really jonesing for a UV erasable EEPROM on your board if you want to make one of these, okay? And maybe I can, you know, come up with a new rev. There might be some other ideas that people have too. Oh, if you did this, then I can, you know, achieve some other goal. Again, let me know in the comments below. Any critiques are welcome on this channel all the time. Number one goal of not using fancy chips here is to get rid of the need for an expensive programmer or the need for me to program a bunch of these and mail them out to everybody that comes along asking for one. This is not a money-making project. This is a DIY, bring this thing up from scratch on your own project, all right? So I don't want to have to, you know, make you guys buy 50 or $500 programmers or whatever it takes these days to program these things, all right? Uh, Having said all that, we still need, as we'll see, a way to boot this thing up. Z80s don't have built-in flash ROMs like most modern controllers do. So we're going to still need some kind of an EEPROM in this system. And I've devised a mechanism that costs about $6. You can build it yourself and connect it to a Raspberry Pi. I assume anybody that would want to take this on has a Raspberry Pi lying around somewhere. So a $6 uh, adapter board, which we'll talk about in another video, will allow you to program the flash and the final design that we're shooting at here while it is in the circuit on our board, okay? That's how I'm going to get around this problem here, right? In a flash uh, prom, uh, those are programmable with just five volts and a simple little adapter for Raspberry Pi will take care of it, okay? So I'm pretty excited. I got rid of, let's just say the expensive programmers. We still need to program the flash is the only issue there, all right? So to achieve the standard CPM style ports, we're gonna need a console. Consoles traditionally were always serial ports. I'm gonna use what's called a three wire RS-232 interface, probably the most common serial interface ever used on CPM. It has one wire to transmit data in a serial one bit at a time form, one wire to receive data, and a ground. You'd be familiar with this if you've ever programmed an Arduino, okay? Now Arduinos have the, uh, they don't actually use RS-232, but they sort of do. Uh, the, the, there's a USB adapter that they solder right onto an Arduino board. So you're actually going USB to an RS-232 style adapter and then back into the Arduino chip. And that would be in the Uno R3, by the way. There's a lot of different Arduino boards out there and they all work differently. But the original one, the Unos, used a um, RS-232 adapter uh, that came in with USB. In this board, if you want to plug it into USB, just go out and get yourself a $7 uh, USB cable, and I'll show you uh, how I do that with my PC when we get there. So how does the Centronics printer port work, or the parallel port, right? You got a printer, you got the host PC over here, or in our case, the Retro Z80 board. It's got a bunch of pins, a bunch of signals that look like this. Now, this is a very uh, expensive interface to add to this project you can leave the one chip out okay and save a dollar if you don't really want one but i really wanted to have it because this is, truly is the experience if you ever print anything out you have to use a dot matrix printer or maybe a daisy wheel if you've got one and listen to the uh, pins hammering on the paper as the head goes back and forth to make that customary sound as the thing prints all right and eventually i'll hook mine up and we'll see that run so how does the thing work, right? Well, you have eight data bits because this is a parallel data uh, port, okay? Eight data bits that go over the printer. Each byte one at a time goes over the data bits here. There's a strobe signal that tells the printer here, look, I put some data on the data bus, take it and print that character now, okay? Then there's some configuration pins that have to do with should the printer automatically uh, skip a line every time you say move the head back to the left with a carriage return or not you know uh i'm not gonna assert line feed i'll go back and then make it i'll feed it manually we'll get there when we talk about the drivers and stuff like that 
There's a pin here that says initialize the printer, which is essentially just resets everything. And there's a select signal that tells the printer whether or not it should uh, observe and behave and react to these signals here. I'm going to just tie that low, okay? We're going to just always have the printer selected. The init in the line feed will be basically off at all times. There's really no need to play with these. So these will, these are you know low use signals, but you got to generate them, otherwise the printer won't work right. Then there's a bunch of status signals that come back from the printer. Let's you know if there's an error. It acknowledges when you strobe a data byte in there. It tells you when it's busy. You know, don't send me data now. I'm busy. I'm printing. Don't send me more data. I can't buffer it up anymore. Then there's a um, paper empty bit. You know, oh, the printer's out of paper, that sort of thing, and a status bit. Now, in order to hook up a, a, uh, a micro SD card between the host and the card, there's four wires. There's a data from the perspective of the SD card, there's a data in, so that's data going from the host to the card. There's a clock that's under control by the host. There's a chip select line and a data out. And the way we're going to operate the SD card for this project is in SPI mode 0. That is opposed to modes 1, 2, and 3. All right. Uh, SPI mode 0 on an SD card is fully specified in a publicly available document. That is what they call like the abridged version or the simplified version of the SD card protocol. You have to be a member of some consortium or pay or whatever to get the documentation on how to operate an SD card in super fancy parallel high-speed mode, okay? And as we're going to see, the Z80 doesn't go anywhere near fast enough to do anything interesting other than pretty much SPI mode zero anyway, all right? So SPI mode zero, quick refresher or introduction if you've never heard of it or don't know or don't remember, it works like this. When the host wants to exchange data with the SD card, and notice I said exchange, not send, because as we're going to see, every time the host asserts chip select, or card select, as it might be uh, called in the SD spec, every time a data bit goes out into the card, another data bit comes back to the host. So this is what we call full duplex serial communication. And no matter what data goes both ways, every time there's a upward uh, edge on the clock signal. So here's what's going on. This diagram we're going to show you transferring two bits from the host to the SD card, and at the same time, two bits coming back from the SD card back to the host. So it would look like this. We enable the SD card by taking the chip select or the card select line low and keeping it low. While it is low, anytime there's a rising edge on the clock signal, we're telling the SD card to accept the one bit value we have on DI and that we and we let it know that we are now reading the one bit on the DO that the card is sending us. So we draw that down here, DI and DO. We say the DI and DO must be stable and consistent before and after and during the rising edge on this clock. We call this time before the rising edge the setup time, and the time after the rising edge is called the hold time. So the setup and hold are greater than zero amount of time, around this rising edge on the clock, all right? And again, the Z80 is going to run so incredibly slow, we don't have to worry at all about the speed, all right? These cards can run like 40 megahertz or something, and we'll be lucky to get 150 kilohertz of data transfer, okay, in, 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 in a bit-banged SPI port on a Z80. Uh, okay, so what happens then? What's going on with this other part? Well, when, the way you normally think of this is whenever the clock falls, that's letting both ends, that's the host basically telling the SD card that it is currently changing the data in and out value, or more literally, it, the host is changing the value on the data that it's sending the SD card on the SD card's input line, okay? And it's authorizing the SD card to change what's happening on the data output line so that uh, an up-and-coming rising edge 
in the future on the clock line will uh, expect that the data lines are stable at that time okay so what do you have you have okay i'm changing this you feel free to change your end get ready okay thank you very much then there's a rising edge here and the sd card grabs whatever bit is on the di line and the host uh, grabs whatever bit of data, the signal on the DO line. And then it happens again and again and again for as many times as you need to move bits back and forth, okay? And this is a tiny diagram. No one in their right mind would ever move two lousy bits between a host and an SD card that's not even legal in the SD protocol. Normally, there's hundreds of bits, right? Like 512 bits uh, that go... Actually, there's <laughs> thousands, I should say, of bits that go at a time. Uh, between the host and the SD card because it moves 512 bytes at a time normally, okay? So that is on the order of 4,000 bits is a normal size transaction here. Obviously, this diagram would be seven miles wide if I drew the whole thing up. <laughs> so, yeah, so here's two you can extrapolate in your head, all right? All right, so let's put all this together in a block diagram. Let's start with our Z80. We know we're going to have a Z80. How do we deal with talking to the console, I'm going to use the Z80SIO, serial I.O. chip. And in there, I'm going to use the UART functionality of the uh, chip. And we're going to see that it has two ports. It's called A and B. And we're going to get an RS-232 driver because this is going to be in TTL level signaling in here. And you're familiar with that, again, if you're messing around with an Arduino. And you have to then get some sort of an RS-232 driver if you want to hook up a genuine, bona fide RS-232 device over here, like my old Televideo 910 terminal. If you want to plug that in, you have to have the right voltages over here, right? So the point is you need to have a driver chip in there. The timer is going to be used if we want to change the baud rate on the SIO. The SIO doesn't have a very flexible, programmable uh, divider in there to, to uh, assign and program the bit rates, okay? So the, the way this used to be done is you got a special timer chip, and you could tell the timer to say, hey, take the baud rate clock, or more accurately, this is a bit rate clock in this scenario. People always use the wrong words, and I'll be consistent, all right? So take the bit rate or the baud rate clock and divide it down to make it slower so that I can choose, you know, 9600 baud instead of, you know, 115.2 or something like that, okay? That's what we're going to use the timer for. And there's four timers in a Z80CTC, so we can have one timer for port A, one timer for port B, and two other timers to do anything we want with, like generate interrupts and keep a real-time clock or something like that, okay? The boot ROM, the, the flash ROM is this here, and we'll talk more about that later. Static RAM is what I'm going to go with here. Um, I showed earlier in the... Uh, the origin video or the background video for this project in the early days you know you could only buy these chips so big and or or you could only afford them <laughs> i could only afford them so big i should say and i could only buy 2k bytes per chip for the static rams that went into my original design back in 1981 nowadays you can get a half a megabyte quite easily for pretty much the same price all on one chip now, in order to meet the 100 millimeter square board design, I can't put 32 2K SRAMs on like I did back in the day. Plus, it would cost more. And just the experience of having all those chips on a board is not that great anyway. It's more stuff to solder in, more stuff to pay for, more stuff that can go wrong. I'm going to just put one big chip on there instead of a bunch of little ones. I don't think it'll change the experience of that much, okay? And it'll probably save you about $40. I'm exaggerating. Well, but, oh, geez, yes, no, I'll bet those do cost 2 or $3 a piece. And like I said, there's 32 of them on there. Yeah, it'll probably save you 50 bucks by just putting one big chip on there, all right? Anyway, okay, so moving along. How then do these all communicate with each other? The... Z80, as I show here, it has, has, has a, a data bus, right? And it has an address bus. The way this whole thing works is whenever the Z80 wants to get a byte of data out of the static RAM or out of the boot ROM, it has to tell these chips the address of the byte that it wants these chips to be 
uh, make available on the data bus. Okay, that's what the address bus is for. You tell the uh, the uh, the the chip, hey, I want you to send me the byte from address, you know, two oh nine, and the chip comes back and comes down the data bus over here. The data bus is green one. Uh, okay, here's the value at that address. Okay, now. The ROMs and the SRAM and all these other chips, as you can see over here, have to be told when it's their turn, okay? That's what these two boxes represent here, the select logic, I say. Memory devices and I.O. devices. These are very similar situations. When is it time for the static RAM to start uh, putting data on the data bus? You know, when the static RAM is sending data to the CPU, it's important that the boot ROM and the CTC and the I, this SIO and these other chips over here, none of these all have to stay quiet in order for this to send this data on the bus without what we call a bus conflict when having multiple things happen at once, right? So uh, this is what these two boxes are for. And we differentiate between memory uh, selection and I.O. port selection. All right, so the I.O. ports on this thing would be it's the S.I.O.'s turn to send the data to the CPU, or maybe the CPU wants to send data into the S.I.O. or the memory or whatever. So only one of these at a time is supposed to be selected so we don't have what's called a bus conflict, all right? Two, two, two chips talking at the same time. Uh, what have I not talked about over here, right? So along with the memory... And the UART in the in the timer. Okay. Now on a Z80, we'll see that it differentiates between interacting with memory devices and interacting with I/O devices. Memory devices have a um, a different address space, we say, than do the I/O devices on a Z80 machine. So a Z80 explicitly says, I want to move memory to or from some address. And independently, it might say, I want to move data to or from an IO device at an IO address, okay? So that's why we have these two separate select boxes here. This one tells the IO devices when it's their turn to talk or listen. And this one tells the memory devices when it's their turn to talk or listen. These down here are going to be discrete uh, chips. The printer port is just going to be a single 8-bit latch. And the Z80 will say, here, put this in the printer port latch to put this set of 8 bits on the data bus now. Thank you very much. So the printer can see them. So there's two, as you can see, the arrow pointing to the right here. There's a little slash with an 8. That means there's 8-bit bus coming out of the PRN, what's going to be a latch. Same thing for the GPIO out. In fact, these are the exact same uh, chips will be used for both of these devices. So the Z80 can say, make these 8 bits have these values. Same thing over here, make these 8 bits have these values. The input chip over here works the other way. The arrow's saying, hey, this is an input device. This is a different chip. It's not a latch. It's just going to be a, a simple buffer. And then this will be used to, to let the Z80 say, hey, turn this buffer on now so I can see what's over here on these eight signals over there, one of which is the data coming out of the SD card. So as we'll see, when the Z80 wants to read the data bit from the SD card, it will read the value from this buffer over here, throw away seven of those eight bits, keep the remaining one, and say, oh, that's the bit that must be coming from the SD card right now. If it wants to talk to the SD card, the Z80 will write a value into this latch over here and say, set the DI bit to this and the clock to whatever and the chip select or the card select line to this value. Okay, so that's this is the general gist of the whole ball game here. Well, what's left? We have the baud rate clock. This is the thing that will generate a, a pulse every time the, the SIO is supposed to send a bit out on one of the serial ports. And we can optionally run it through this timer and divide the frequency down in order to run it at slower bit rates, which is, this is how they uh, it's always done. Whether the UART itself has a divider in it or you use an external chip to divide it down, doesn't matter. This is how you set your bit rates on, on, uh, for serial communications. There's a separate clock I'm going to use as a system clock. The reason I have two separate clocks, this is not all that typical. Uh, it, uh, the reason I did this is because 
I wanted to be able to run the system clock as fast as I can. And quite often, uh, designers will, will use the same clock for both of these. And what that does is it says your system clock, if you combine these, has to be a multiple or a very close to a multiple of the bit rate that comes out of the UART so that you can run it through a divider and come up with the right frequency. Now, if I want to run my Z80 at 10 megahertz and I want to run my serial port at like 38,400, there won't be an evenly divisible number to come up with that bit rate. We could probably come close enough and it'll probably work, but it won't be exactly correct. And there are some baud rates that just won't work at all. You'll be off by like a half a bit width and it just will screw up. It just won't be reliable if it works at all. All right. So uh, how do you solve that when you have one single clock? Well, what you do is you decide what your baud rate's going to be. And then you say, well, what's an even multiple of that frequency that I can buy a crystal that will oscillate at that frequency and that is less than or equal to the maximum speed that the Z80 can run at, okay? And in the end, what happens is the math determines that the, you, you slow down your Z80 CPU is normally what happens to run it at the nearest but not... Uh, uh, greater than speed that the chip is rated for. And almost all computers back in the day use that technique to save a dollar or two. Uh, and the result is, of course, the machine runs slower than it otherwise could. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to just have two clocks. You'll also see another reason to have two clocks. <laughs> and that is, if you change the system clock speed, which we can do with this quite easily, you don't have to worry about your baud rate clock divider anymore. Uh, the logic and the dividers and stuff like that that control the SIO will be the same as long as you never change the baud rate clock. But you can arbitrarily then change your system clock independently of these two. And this there's, there's benefits of doing that, okay? Uh, reset logic is another thing. This is a kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, chips back in the day had certain requirements that they be reset in a certain way, and if you don't do that, they don't work right. Modern chips have built-in reset logic in the CPUs, okay? So in this case, we're going to have to be somewhat careful and make sure we do this just right, all right? Now, it turns out this is not at all hard to do. You, you, I mean, you can do this quite easily with a simple capacitor and a resistor and a push button, but I've added a little bit of extra logic in here because... I want to be able to plug in, when all is said and done, the flash programmer, as we'll see, into this board while it, the whole board is you know, running. You know, I don't want to plug it in while it's running, but I want to be able to have the uh, flash programmer run in circuit with all the other chips in here. And when we do that sort of thing, we have to make sure everyone behaves just right when we reset the system. So I'm going to add a whopping like 30 cents to the cost of this board by adding a transistor into this reset logic, which will allow the, the flash programmer essentially to reset this system if it so needs to do so, all right? So that is something we're going to have to pay some attention to over here. So that is the bird's eye view of where we're heading here. Next time, we'll talk about the schematic, the details of each one of these connections. Thanks for watching. See you next time.